So I am uh, Gulur Khatak. I am a doctoral student at CERN. So we are working on generative adversarial networks for um, simulation or, or perhaps simulation. So I'm going to today I'm going to talk about the effort for uh, training the networks in a distributed manner. So the talk today will be in uh, two parts. The first part will be the general introduction of the 3D GAN network, and the next part will uh, be about uh, why we use distributed training and uh, how we implemented it and some of the results. And in the end, I will give a summary. So high energy uh, physics simulation is a very time consuming process and it involves heavy computation. The reason for this is that it is based on the Monte Carlo technique. So that really means that at every step that a particle travels, we have to evaluate the, the next step. So we have to draw a random number from a distribution and we have to check whether how much distance this particle is going to travel before it undergoes a physics process. And at every step, the distance to the volume boundaries is uh, calculated. And then we have, uh, we decide whether to propagate this particle or to undergo a physics process. And this process is repeated for each step in a particle's trajectory. And it is repeated for all the primary particles and the secondary particles. So that is why if uh, we look at WLCG, it is like uh, 200 computer centers in 20 countries consisting of 600K cores. And more than 50% of these resources are used for simulation. And in 2025, we are going to have an upgrade. So that means that the, the data is they're going to be even more granular and there is, it's going to increase. And then we need some other techniques in order to speed up the simulation. So the currently available fast simulation techniques are detector dependent. Therefore, we needed to Sort of like this was an effort to find a general fast simulation tool that would be based on deep learning. So our vision for a fast simulation network was something like this, that we should be able to take the data for any detector and take any physical constraint, uh, the physics constraints, and then we uh, should be able to automatically get the best architecture and the bus hyperparameters according to a hyperparameter scan. And uh, to run this uh, scan in an acceptable amount of time, we needed a distributed training. So the part of our work was like in two main steps. The first step was to see whether indeed we can use the image simulation methods for physics simulation, whether the images that we get are in fact accurate from physics point of view and uh, whether we can uh, increase the size of the data and whether it's going to cope with the increase in detectors um, complexity. Understanding the performance of this network and to validate the physics accuracy. So this was the first part of the work. And the second part was about generalizing the approach. So we needed to use hyperparameter scans and we needed to find the best architecture and other hyperparameters and also we needed to understand and optimize the computing resources that will be involved. So the first data that we took was for the click calorimeter data set. This is not a present detector. This is a proposed detector for future. So the reason we took this, that this is a highly granular detector. So the detector response in a calorimeter can be regarded as a 3D image. So energy depositions that are left by particles can be regarded as pixel intensities in a picture. So here we see the click uh, detector, uh, the click calorimeter, and we see that it consists of an E-cal and an H-cal. E-cal is the electromagnetic calorimeter, and around it we have the hadronic calorimeter. For the present work, we only use the uh, E-cal data, and we use 200,000 electron events that go from 10 to 500 GV. And this is simulated using Gen4. Each of these events is a 25 by 25 by 25 image. This means that it is like 15,000 cells 
And these cells are selected around the very center of a particle shower. As you can see below, a particle comes at a certain primary energy. Then it leaves some energy in different EKL cells. And this energy is recorded as an image. These images are different from other traditional images. One, that these are sparse. And then the intensities cover a much larger spectrum, and it covers many orders of magnitude. So this is uh, the network that we used. We used generative adversarial network that consists of a generator and a discriminator. So the way we use this is that we uh, use a discriminator to differentiate between the images that are, have been simulated by our generator and the images from the Gen4 data. So we train the generator in such a way as to minimize the, uh, as to, um, so that the discriminator can get confused between the images that are generated by the generator and the real data. So in this way, we uh, allow the generator to learn in an implicit manner all the properties of our data set. So the generator uses a latent noise vector, and it also uses some uh, uh, parameter, like for example, in this network we use energy of the primary particle, and then our generator consists of dense layer and three-dimensional convolutional layers, and uh, we use the leaky ReLU activation function, and then we get these generated images. And then the discriminator is used to assign, to look at each image and decide whether it is real or fake, and to assign each image to a certain primary energy. And we also check for the total intensities that have been deposited by a particle in image as an equal loss. So this is a view of our network. So what we really aim uh, in this form of training is that the discriminator should be confused between the, the, generate, the images that are generated and the data images. So we see that the loss of generator decreases uh, and the loss of discriminator increases till they go into a stable situation. And below you can see how the discriminator output shows uh, total confusion between the real and the generated images. In our loss equation, we use different types of losses um, we use percentage loss and we use the binary cross entropy. So we use weights to uh, give a, a correct weightage to all of these losses. So in our training, because this is not a conventional training, they, it is very time consuming because we first need to produce fake images and then we need to train the discriminator on these fake images and once on the fake images and once on the G4 images. And to balance it, we need to train the generator twice as well. And similarly, in our testing loop, we also have, uh, we also first generate fake images and then we evaluate discriminator on fake images and real images. And similarly, we find the generator loss. So this is some uh, figures from uh, our performance of the 3D GAN. Now the figures here mostly are histograms because that is how we analyze performance in high energy physics. So we see that uh, on, the, on my right hand, you would see that we have the log scale uh, energy deposition as we, as we go along x axis, y axis, and z axis. So the results that we have for the generated images show a similar behavior to the Gen 4 images that uh, have been simul simulated using the full Monte Carlo process. And then we see uh, at the top, we see the sampling fraction, which is another part of a detector, which shows uh, the total energy that is deposited by a particle in the calorimeter, the relation of that energy to the primary energy of the particle. So we see that the GAN and the data images follow the same similar behavior. And then uh, I have also included the plots for different energies going from 50, 100, 400, and 500 GV. We see that the images that are produced by the GAN are uh, to, within 10% to images that are produced uh, that are from the actual data. So from here, uh, I would like to now give some figures about the level of speed up that we achieve with 3D GAN. Using the Gen4 full simulation for an electron shower takes about 17,000 milliseconds 
on Intel's Xeon Platinum 8180. On the same hardware, 3D GAN takes about seven milliseconds to generate the same shower. Now, 3D GAN can even uh, run on a laptop Intel i7 and take 66 milliseconds per shower. And then it can take, if we go to GTX 1080, it can take about 0 0.04 milliseconds. So on a similar hardware, we have a factor of greater than 2,500 uh, speed up. So as far as inference is concerned, this is a very uh, good performance. But uh, indeed, when we go towards training, we see that the current time for training of one epoch is greater than 3,600 seconds, like about one hour on P100. And it usually takes up about 30 to 50 epochs. So that means it takes around days. And then if we design a hyperparameter scan, it can take up to months. So it is essential for us in somehow to speed up this training process. And then if we speed up the training process, there can be other use cases, for example, in detector design studies. So parallel processing is the only solution that we have for this problem. So the second part of the talk is going to be about the distributed training. So our, our aim was to implement uh, data parallelism and study scaling on clusters. There were different implementations. One was using Cray ML plugin, second was Horowat, and third was the MPI Learn, as Felice described in his talk a while ago. So with the synchronous data parallelism, with the Cray ML plugin, the scaling was done across different GPU and CPU nodes. The batch time remains the same, and the number of epochs that we need to run uh, to get a convergence uh, decrease with the number of nodes. And uh, synchronous uh, SGD was used. And they, uh, in the Cray ML plugin, we have a custom optimized already operation, which is reported to be about 35% faster than those available at Cray. And uh, now, in order to get uh, an idea about the time frame, the 16 node uh, training took only two hours. So these are some of the configurations for the hardware and of the C, uh, CPU and GPA, GPU system that we tested on. So uh, from these results, we see that there is an almost linear scaling of a number of nodes uh, using the GPU and the CPU. And the average time per epoch is, remains almost constant. So that means that the overhead for communication is not much. So now we look at uh, the performance of uh, uh, how the performance varies with increasing the number of nodes. So it was observed like this uh, plot here shows the same sampling fraction that I described earlier. Now we see how it changes using one GPU, two GPUs, four, eight, and 16 GPUs. So we see a slight decrease in performance, especially below 100 GV. So we are working in order to improve this and to understand why this is there. Okay, so there was another uh, effort that was done uh, uh, with the training with Horowod. So for this implementation, we use the Intel optimized TensorFlow 1.9 and it uses the AVX 512 instructions and it also uses the MKL DNN with 3D convolutional support. And uh, to get the best from the number of cores that we have, the inter and intra or parallel threads were set accordingly. And we used Horowod and the synchronous, synchronous SGD approach. Uh, so this was run on the tax MP2 cluster which has dual socket Intel Xeon 8160 and 24 int multiplied by two cores per node. So different scheduling configurations were tested using two, four, and eight processes per node. And the best efficiency was with four processes per node. It seems to be fine. Thank you. Okay, so these are some uh, results for scaling. So uh, in the first plot on the right hand, I will show the speed up that was uh, 
the speed up, which was the result of the Intel optimized uh, DNA, uh, the MKL DNN. So uh, the first plot is for the baseline without any optimization. And then we get uh, order of three optimization by using the Intel MKL DNN. And then if we use uh, another ar an architecture that was like the most uh, efficient for uh, the implementation, then we get a further uh, to, uh, uh, speed up. And then if we use four workers per node, there is uh, some additional speed up. So the plot, uh, the other plot is for the four workers per node uh, setup. So we see that uh, there is almost linear scaling up to 128 cores. So uh, this is, uh, and we see that the efficiency also remains sort of like good. So now again, we are we will look at the performance, and we see uh, that there is somewhat degradation, performance degradation for low energy reason, regions. And here, this data, this plot shows the same sampling fraction uh, using uh, different uh, effective batch sizes. So the greater the number of nodes, the more is the effective batch size. So in the end, I will talk about the MPI Learn uh, implementation, which was uh, uh, discussed by Felice uh, today. So here, uh, I think that he described all the details very well. So I will present some of the, re some of the results. And we see that the scaling is not uh, very linear, but we see that the, at low energies, we have a much better performance. And there's not much uh, degradation, but these are this work is ongoing, and these are only our some preliminary um, results. So in the end, I will go towards a summary. And uh, so uh, what was our initial aim was, firstly, we achieved uh, uh, physics accuracy to an acceptable level. The second uh, goal that we achieved was that the inference speed up with respect to full Monte Carlo is greater than 2,500. Now the next goal is to reduce the training time. For this goal, different distributed approaches were applied and validated, and a hyperparameter scan based on a distributed approach is next to be implemented using the MPI opt. And ultimately, we will try to generalize the approach for different kinds of HEP detectors belonging to a certain class. Okay, so that's the end of the talk. Thank you, if there's any questions.